into the Spa Leaders Masterclass Series. I hope you and your businesses are thriving no matter where you may be in the world. My name is Sal Capizzi, former spa director, current digital media specialist here at Spa Executive and host of the Spa Leaders Masterclass Series. Today, I am joined by Amanda Frazier, Executive Vice President of Standards and Ratings for Forbes Travel Guide. Amanda, thank you so much for being a part of the Spa Leaders Masterclass Series today. Of course, so thank you for inviting me. It's nice to have a conversation with you. Of course. Now, Forbes Travel Guide is the only independent global rating system for luxury hotels, restaurants, and spas. They <laughs> verify luxury. And talk about Establish. Forbes Travel was founded in 1958 and created the original five-star rating system. They evaluate properties based on up to 900 objective standards and that may seem like a lot of boxes to check but after you get a forbes travel rating your property is sure to be placed on the map of luxury and their beautiful website one thing i personally love about forbes travel guide is that they do not just stop at pretty pictures and ratings on their website and blog they actually offer travel tips to potential guests visiting your property or the region itself so guests can better prepare for their arrival or vacation on an international trip. Now that comes in extremely handy for say, any first time visitors of the different regions of the world and beyond. Amanda, you have been with Forbes Travel Guide for over 15 years, and I think it's safe to say that you have seen the good, the great, the bad, the ugly. <laughs> but even prior to that, you have over 13 years of experience in hospitality operations, working in various leadership roles in luxury hotels. I'd like to take the initiative to let our viewers know that all of the insights that we discussed today are coming from a true superstar in this industry. <laughs> well, thank you, Sally. You are very, very kind. And thank you for that great introduction to Forbes Travel Guide. We have a small but mighty team. <laughs> And a well-respected team, I just want to throw in there. <laughs> now, speaking of superstars, I'm going to jump in right into the million dollar question that everyone wants to know. How are properties initially selected for an opportunity to be rated by Forbes Travel? That's a great first question. And, you know, there's not as much mystery to the process as one might think. You know, I mentioned the team. We have a team in ratings and one of their many jobs um, day in, day out, as, as we do, is to find the best hotels in the world and restaurants and spas. And initially, before we commit a restaurant or a spa or a hotel to the schedule, what we do is essentially the research um, that can be online research. It can be information that comes to us. It can also be the properties themselves raising their hand and say, hey, <laughs> how <me>. about me? <laughs> I'd like to be considered. And, you know, of course, we have a process. So what we do is we look at the things we can view and assess without having to visit the property to make sure that there are certain elements that we know that if we did go there and invest our time and our money, that it would be sure to achieve at least a recommended, which is our entry level award. Um, so once a property has achieved that status, that it, it's essentially approved for a future evaluation um, and it stays on a big list. Um, and every year um, we look and we see and we spearhead the process of where are we expanding coverage? Where have we not been that we need to go? Where, which hotels within those new destinations should we cover? And that's essentially the, the very, very start of the process. Once a property then is committed to a schedule, um, you know, that is then the start of the evaluation and, and everything else that, that happens thereafter. That's that's awesome. And like you said, much simpler than even yeah. I would have thought. <laughs> All they have to do is raise their hand or, you know, come via recommendation, maybe from another uh, brand or property that has already been rated. Um, and then you guys will start the uh, the initial scheduling and evaluation process. That's great. Now, follow up to that question. Once they're in, once they're on Forbes Travel Guide's radar, how do brands achieve a five-star rating and what does that typically consist of? So an evaluation that we conduct, our standards, those 900 you mentioned before, which is if we evaluate your hotel, your restaurant, and a spa, if it's a, just okay. a hotel, it's, it's only 500. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so it's just a few less. Uh, no pressure. No pressure. Um, those standards are assessed for all rating levels. So once we come in and start evaluating, your performance against all of those standards is what ultimately determines if you achieve a recommended four or five. And um, there is a misconception that people will say, can you send me your standards? I want to only see the five-star standards. 
well, no, these are all the standards and how many of them you achieve and how well you execute them is what determines the rating. And then the biggest thing is really just to you know, speak directly to your question is how our algorithm focuses on the service aspects. So a facility is really important because that to your earlier question is what gets you on our radar in the first place. It's worth 25% of the final star rating at all levels. And then the service is worth 75%. Okay. So what we look at is all of the standards and the performance against all of the criteria, but the algorithm places a heavier weight on service. So if you excel at service standards, then you rise naturally higher in the system. Keeping in mind that that's not to diminish the facility, it has to be excellent, but people will remember the service. Absolutely. And that's essentially what also keeps, you know, businesses uh, continuing on, on an upward trajectory. Always, you know, the, the service standards. Exactly. Because you can, you know, not, I was going to say anyone can build a beautiful hotel. Not anyone can, but you can within reason build a beautiful hotel, but how you execute the service and bring that personality of the property alive is, is very different. It's definitely always about the people in it, the teams and the services um, that they provide. Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, I would like to know what is one prime example of something a property did that you were absolutely astounded by that you weren't expecting that landed them a five star rating. Um, maybe it was something in the beginning of your career that you know you saw one specific property do that then became, you know, kind of a line item, a checkbox, um, and became an, a, a new standard. So what was something you were absolutely astounded by? Gosh, there's been a lot over the years. Um, and, you know, sometimes I think when you think about this and people think about the, the wow moments that sometimes they're known, you know, we tend to think big. And, you know, what are the most amazing things I can do for the guests to make sure that they have the best experience? And really at the end of the day, sometimes thinking a little bit smaller, a little bit simpler are the most powerful moments. So just, you know, as an example of that, I remember um, a property that I was leaving. It is now a five. I forget specifically at the time of my visit, if it was a five at the time, but um, it is now a five-star hotel. Um, when I was leaving, it was down here in the South. Um, it was a hot, humid morning. And there was dew um, that had obviously accumulated on the car window. They wiped it off for me. So I, when I got in my car, there was nothing else for me to do. I just had to drive off. Now, that might seem like a really straightforward, yes. unimpressive thing. But to the guest, you know, to me in that moment, one less thing to do. Anytime you take a job away from a guest. And listen, I'm talking about it. And it was 14, you know, 13, yes. 14 years ago. So I remember those things. Um, and like we were saying, you know, with teams and the people going above and beyond, when you have, yeah. it sounds like uh, your valet personnel taking the extra step and going the extra mile to not only, you know, bring the car around, but make sure the windshield is clear, you know, whether it's <laughs> dew or snow or somebody's, you know, out west or up north and there's frost all over it, that really says a lot on it does. You know, how the guests, the guests overall experience. It does. I mean, you know, just to speak to that a little bit more, and you can get in a car and there are many amazing hotels that will put a bottle of water in your car and an amenity. But if you still have to get out your car to do something so you can start your journey, it's just those little things make a big difference. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And on the opposite of that question, just because we need to know, what was something a property did where it may have had the adverse effect? Maybe you had to take a step back and say to yourself, did I really just see that? You know, I'm always very empathetic, I would mm -hmm. say, so Things happen. as you mentioned, I started in the industry and I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure I made my fair share of rookie <laughs> mistakes as well. But, Same. you know, I think over the years, there's, uh, there's always... You know, there's, there's never a need to be rude. And, yeah. you know, we're in this industry to be hospitable and to have a passion for serving people and, and giving them great experiences. And I think a couple of things stick out in my mind, um, which I think are inexcusable because you can't say you weren't trained on that or yeah. you didn't know that wasn't appropriate. And, you know, I do remember there's been times when you overhear staff speaking yeah. inappropriately. Yeah. Um, that, you know, there was, I remember there was a situation in an elevator where a, 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 a sitting president was coming in and the staff were talking very negatively about what their owner had asked them to do in preparation for the president's arrival. And that was very uncomfortable for me as a guest. And yeah. you know, so anytime you overhear staff or you see them behaving very casually um, yeah. that makes you uncomfortable, I think that takes away from the experience because it reflects poorly, not just on that individual, 
put on the brand and the hotel um, right, as well. Right. Yeah. right. And just because, you know, that certain sitting president that, you know, what that they were preparing for arrival for, just because he didn't hear it, if other guests can hear it, that could create a totally uncomfortable situation. So I could totally see um, how that adversely kind of yeah. affected, yeah, <laughs> adversely affected your experience there. Thinking about the future, so many businesses and brands and properties have changed their standards as they start doing big business again in a post-COVID world. Will Forbes Travel change any standards or thresholds on how ratings are conducted? And if so, what will those changes look like or be? We have an annual process for refinements. So every year we refine the standards. Um, during the pandemic and as we kind of come out of the, the, you know, the, the heaviest part of the, the regulations around the pandemic. We've had a lot of changes that we've made. We actually, right in the middle of the pandemic, quickly made midstream changes, concessions, we, as you, were, uh, you might call them, to make sure that for those hotels that were still open and operating, they weren't unfairly penalized. Yeah. But now that, to your point, we're kind of looking ahead, um, you know, as far as the benchmarks and the, the uh, scores that are required, we're too early in the year to determine if we're changing anything for next year just yet. Um, but as far as the standards, yes. Rather than making concessions, c continued concessions, which are difficult to, to figure out when you, you know, you've got, you've got, it's very difficult to have one rule over here and another rule over there. So that was a temporary moment in time. And of course, we, we, uh, we wouldn't dream of not doing that. But yeah. looking forward to have some stability and to, ensure that that line between where does service stop and now you've just turned what you're not doing into an inconvenience for the guest. Yeah. We have to, you know, obviously put it, put, put our arms around that. So what we have done is we've removed essentially what we would previously call the COVID concessions. And we've okay. either redefined or rewritten certain requirements so that there is an easier way to look at approaching the service that's required or the criteria. Um, you know, just as an example, in spas, we are in the midst of the pandemic, um, especially with the whole social distancing um, concerns, which is obviously still a concern, but especially when it was pre-vaccine, pre um, we removed or said that if you didn't escort your guest to the locker room or to their treatment room and you just provided directions because of social distancing, we would make that standard an NA which was great last year and it worked. But moving forward, you know, at the end of the day to give the best service, you need to kind of take the guests through their experience. They need to know where they're going so they don't feel anxious or concerned or lost. Um, so that standard is still a requirement, but how you execute it doesn't mean you have to be physically on top of the guests when you're escorting them. If you can <laughs> find a way to safely do that and respect social distancing, but still just decide not to not do it yeah. because of social distancing, then that's the refinement that we're looking at. That's how we've approached the standards for 2022. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's totally a great, uh, a great point that you just made. And I think, um, I think there are certain ways, like you said, you don't need to be, you know, physically on top of the gas, but you know, you could stand, you know, a foot away, or I know at a lot of properties and brands, they, they are still, maybe the guests aren't required to uh, wear masks in common areas, but I know a lot of properties where staff still have to wear masks. So if you're in a very, you know, member facing, um, or client facing, you know, environment where, you know, uh, hallways with, you know, everybody's experiencing this travel boom right now, you know, in order to, you know, still put amenities like, you know, walking your guests to a spa service in place, um, maybe for that duration, walking along the corridors or the hallways, you know, that staff member does wear a mask or something yeah. like that. Exactly, exactly. Awesome. All right. I want to jump in to some questions from our viewers. Now, I was so excited to speak with you on behalf of Forbes Travel Guide, but I think the excitement from our viewers has far surpassed mine. <laughs> <laughs> we have had a ton of questions come in because now everyone wants to know what they can be doing. So every customer that visits them has an exceptional five-star experience. Amanda, we may have to have you back for either a part two or an encore Q&A episode <laughs> because we have had that many questions come in. But for now, let's just jump into some of the top questions from our okay. viewers. All right. What is the most frequently missed standard during the spa assessment? Um, you know, 
we're still not at the end of our current year and obviously things get a little out of whack with with the pandemic but you know interestingly um one of the standards that just dropped off a little bit and i wouldn't say it was a st there's, there's more standards it's more of a classification than a standard but there was a drop off in cleanliness so that has been something in more recent evaluations which has been surprising for us um in spas as well where there's been this little bit of a drop off um around around the facility um but second to that you know the the, the other area that tends to be more challenging for spas to deliver on um, and I'm not sure why it's something that we can look, you know, we're going to have to look into, but as far as offering a variety of snacks, so we do have a standard that says there needs to be some type of refreshment out and that it needs to offer, you know, not just um, nutritious and healthy food, but just things that are approachable and enjoyable to the guests. That standard is missed um, less than half of the visits that we make as well. So interesting. That that is a very that is very interesting, and because I would think now just with all the cleaning protocols in place, do you just personally do you think that's because of the great staffing issues some properties um, are having across all industries, or do you think it's just not being done casually anymore? I think it's a little bit of both. I think okay. it's a little bit of a, a combination of a few things. I think you know it's just attention to detail and maybe not wanting to be in the space to respect social distancing. But then there's a longer lag time between when things do get attended to. Um, and you know our standard isn't just that it was a little bit clean. Our standard is it has to be very very clean. So sometimes you know just a leftover razor or item yeah. from another guest can give the impression it hasn't been attended to, yeah. uh, and that can result in a no. And it's it. it it's a very fine line between, you know, clean and very clean. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. And everybody at it, the spa, the spa itself is one of the most, you know, vulnerable places on a property in a brand. I mean, you have, you know, people, people receiving vulnerable services. And the last thing you want is to see, you know, another guest, you know, trash, whether that be a razor or used toothbrush or shaving cream all over the counter. That's the last thing you want to see at what, what is soon to be a five-star, uh, a five-star rated property. Exactly. So I totally get it there. And yeah, I I think there are different ways around, you know, providing snacks, you know, whether healthy, approachable, things like that. I know in the beginning of the pandemic, um, when I was in my sitting role as a spa director, um, everyone, there wasn't a lot of information around, you know, COVID or what was going on. Right. So we actually started wrapping um, the apples and bananas in saran mm -hmm. wrap. It wasn't the most ideal aesthetically, but we were trying to take the approach where we could still offer these to the guests in a uh, in a safe manner so they know that you know people weren't standing over them breathing over them so we tried to make do with the information we had when the pandemic first started it, it was a lot to navigate it was <laughs> and, you know it's something interesting that we saw is that the hotels and restaurants and spas that looked at a regulation that stopped them doing something they'd ordinarily done and said well we're not just going to not do it we're going to yeah. figure out a way to still meet that requirement because it meant something to the guests we're going to you know circumnavigate it those are the properties that rose continued to rise i should say in the system even during the pandemic yeah absolutely yeah. i totally get it yeah. um another question what is the most common luxury amenity in five star spas oh gosh the most common luxury <laughs> amenity um you know a heated think... table just say it <laughs> no i'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> you know i think what really sets a spa apart because you know at the end of the day at the four and five star level because we don't have recommended spas mm -hmm. the staff are 99 of the time extremely well trained it's very rare to come across a therapist that has no idea you know doesn't know what they're doing so kind of what that tipping point sometimes can be is the facility itself and i think anytime a spa really invests in you know, not just going through either our standards or their own brand standards, a checklist and saying, I have my sauna, I have my steam room, I have my cold therapy, I have my heat therapy, is looking at the environment. There are spas that really have embraced their destination and um, their environment and built areas that bring the spa to more of an experience than just a treatment. And it gives you somewhere to have, you know, pre-treatment and post-treatment time. I think a spa that sticks out in my mind that does that particularly well is Spa Botanica. Um, at Dorado Beach, mm -hmm. um, which is a five-star spa, um, but has all that wonderful outdoor space that literally feels that, you know, kind of you're in the jungle. Um, yeah. And it's very destination-centric. You really couldn't be many other at many other spas than, than 
concept in that particular spot. Got it. Because it's the entire experience from start to finish. Like you said, they uh, they kind of mirrored uh, a jungle rainforest uh, aesthetic aspect. So it really puts the guests in that uh, in that kind of state and mindset before they go in to receive their treatments. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What what is the smallest spa with a five star rating and what is the largest spa with a five star rating um we could either you know get into real details or just room treatment size i mean yeah. is, is there a specific spa that you know maybe had two treatment rooms but they just did everything from start to finish and it was absolutely mind-blowing you know it's a good question we assess we call uh, large, large and small by treatment rooms um and, you know, if we go on that method, then the Ritz Spa at the Four Seasons Spa in, in Lisbon okay. um, has four treatment rooms. It's a pretty big spa, but their treatment room, they only have four treatment rooms, and that is a five-star spa. So that's a, that's a very, very, uh, that's a great facility. And then the largest is the uh, Aria, the spa at the Aria Resort oh, Casino yeah. in Las Vegas. I think it's 62 treatment rooms. They're, they're pretty big. <laughs> I've been there. That spa, the, yeah. the Aria is gorgeous itself from start to finish. Yeah. Parking's a little difficult to navigate, but <laughs> everything else is superb. Yeah, they, they do an amazing job. So yeah. it doesn't matter, you know, it's not about how big or small your property is, how many staff you have, how many you don't. Um, it's really how you achieve the experience you're trying to deliver to the guest. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. To totally, totally understand. Uh, totally understand that. Um, we kind of touch on this a little bit, but one of our viewers wants to know, what are new standards that are required post COVID for the spas and how can spas maintain all of the rituals and protocols of excellence while maintaining the COVID regulations? Now, I know you had kind of just touched on this in finding um, certain workarounds and certain, um, and certain standards that were given um, the grace period of like receiving a not applicable at the time, um, certain workarounds, um, but are there any additional um, standards that you know would have to be altered that come to mind first and foremost while certain properties brand spas are trying to maintain that standard of excellence you know because of what um we actually i mean the, the short answer is we really didn't add very many new standards to spas okay. at all for 2022 we, we wanted to, and and honestly just in general we wanted to not make the jump from 21 which was already a difficult year to 22 yeah. Hey, look at all the new <laughs> standards you now have to think about too. What we wanted to do was work on what we currently had and ensure that it matched new expectations that guests might have and what their focus points are. So to that end, we did take a closer look at cleanliness um, so that obviously just because we saw that unusual drop off, um, which is starting to come back up, by the way, just as a word of encouragement. But um, we did take a closer look and re worded and redefined what it means to be to have a really clean spa and we you know we did this across hotels as well where we're really looking at essentially sometimes it feels very unfair for example like we were saying before that you get a no yeah. because there was one razor left in the shower from a guest that you just missed but everything right. else was clean so we have additional criteria that says you know what were there excessive cleanliness conditions so if that razor was one of many, many other cleanliness issues, you're going to get essentially another no, therefore kind of tampering right. your score. If that razor, and we'll just use the razor as an example, <laughs> if that razor was an isolated incident, it's going to get a no, but then you're going to get a balanced amount of credit for not having an excessively unclean facility. So we've put some balance in there to allow us still to be very critical because the guest is not because we want to be but you know this is what it is right now um but also to make sure that it's fairly assessed for what it is right and it's great that and it's great that you give you know leeway on certain things like that because that's kind of the worst scenario and you know i've been yeah. in it i'm sure you've been in it you know you you, you have people that you know scrub the showers all day but that one guest comes in yeah. starts throwing their towels all over the locker room <laughs> Yeah. That was just clean like three minutes ago. And that's something that, you know, nobody wants to miss a score factor for. So it's good that you guys, it's great that you guys give a little yeah. bit of leeway um, there. 
What are the, I just want to ask, what are the 10 key steps to follow during a Forbes visit in the spa? Now, I think this viewer may mean, what is the typical um, touch points in a typical um, walkthrough of an evaluation of a spa? They don't, I'm sure we don't have to hit T, uh, <laughs> ten, ten, the, the specific 10 key yeah. steps, but just like, you know, is it the check-in process? Is it, you know, somebody coming to get you from your room to walk you to the spa? What do you, what, what, you know, what are the most popular touch points during ev an evaluation of the spa? Yeah, that's great. And thank you for clarifying that. Because I was going to say there's there's almost 250 <laughs> touch points, and it would take a little while for us to go through all of this today. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I think if you're going to put everything as a snapshot of kind of the postcard moments of what you want to be thinking about from the guest perspective, because that's the important thing to remember is that our standards aren't written for the spas for their operational SOPs. Our standards are purely written from the guest point of view. What's important to the guest and what has the biggest impact on them. So the first place to start is obviously with your reservation process, your website, how you promote your menu, and making sure that by the time that reservation call or experience, even if it's online, is complete, that spa guest feels a sense of anticipation that's positive. They have an excitement. They feel that their details are booked, they're secure, and that all has to come together through a various set of obviously behind the scenes uh, procedures. But then once you get there, it's about feeling expected. So you've got the pre-arrival touch point, but then as soon as you get there, it's really nice to know that the property is well prepared, the spa is well prepared for your arrival. There's no, who are you? What yeah. did you have booked? <laughs> um, it's, it's really going to set everything off on the wrong tone, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if your guest has to, you know, they're obviously, you know, at this property to relax or maybe on business and they want to check out the spot, you know, what have you. But, you know, I've definitely been in situations where, you know, the the practitioners themselves have like asked me like, oh, what are you getting today? And I'm never sure <laughs> if it's like because they want to confirm they're going to be doing the right thing. But my approach, you know, as as a massage therapist myself, as a former spa director, it was always, you know, once you're in that room with the guests, you know, identify what service you're going to be doing. And then if it seems appropriate, if you're, you know, establishing that rapport, rapport with the guests, you know, mention any add-ons then, but if the practitioner, you know, that's greeting you or that you're in the room with automatically starts of, I see we're doing the aromatherapy uh, massage today with a lavender scent that, you know, just goes to show the guests that, uh, that they're being paid attention to as, as well as, you know, what service they're getting. Exactly, exactly. And that's such an important part as well, that there's a little dialogue maybe at some appropriate point so that, you know, to make sure that that guest goals and their, their wellness goals are really going to be achieved and nothing's yeah. changed. Um, so, I mean, so that would be the third point, definitely making sure there's some uh, confidence and, and dialogue with the, with the treatment itself. And then, of course, making sure the facility is well prepared for every guest. Um, you know, some spas do a, a lot of processes where things are laid out in a more general fashion. It's always great, especially now with the post-COVID regulations, to see when a locker is not just ready for you, but maybe it's been preset with your own snack and your own water and obviously your towel and any other amenities that you might have. So that, you know, nobody likes to go into a spa and the uh, locker attendants wandering around as if they're not quite sure what lock. It should be feel very purposeful that that locker was, you know, prepared for you. Um, and then, of course, you know, after your treatment, which, which we touched on, it, it, it's about not forgetting the guest at the end of the stay. That, departure just as we say in hotels all the time is equally as important as that arrival process and so make sure that as we said that the guest feels welcomed on arrival but on departure they don't feel that they've left unnoticed um, and it, it you, you it's a fine balance at the five star level and the four star level because it's not about hovering over the guest yeah. to make them feel that there's somebody permanently there because that's uncomfortable too but also just striking that balance of feeling that you're looked after, that things have been preset for you and that you don't have to necessarily ask for things, but that the staff know that you're there. Absolutely. And I totally understand what you're saying. It is a very <laughs> fine line, you know, hovering over someone <laughs> and making sure they're well taken care of. But if the same effort of acknowledgement is put into a guest departure, whether that's, you know, from the property itself or from a select department, F&B or the spa, you know, if that guest feels like their needs were paid attention to, that they were paid attention to, you know, during the check-in, check-out reservation process, if that guest feels that they were, you know, their needs were 
were attended to and they were paid attention to through the entire experience, more than likely before they depart the property, they will be back for another service at that spa because you just made them feel, you know, that their experience was amazing from start to finish. Exactly. Exactly. And it's, it's, you know, it's easy to sit here and talk about those points. It's very hard to execute. And that's why, you know, it's not everyone can achieve at that rating, but yeah. you know, for those that do, it's important that that effort's acknowledged. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. All right. We are on the final question from one of our yeah. viewers. There was about 3,008 more, but we're going to, we're going to, we're going <laughs> to wrap it up here. Um, I have the next question. Somebody said, we manage multiple properties at a variety of hotels that are very different. For example, the Ritz-Carlton Spa Chicago and our own branded K Alma Spa at the Victor Hotel in Miami. How much does the rating of the hotel play into the spa being eligible for a Forbes rating? The ratings in and of themselves aren't connected. They're completely okay. separate. So when we evaluate a hotel, a restaurant, or a fine dining, establishment even if it's within the same hotel they all are eligible to achieve their own ratings so you can have a five-star hotel a four-star spa and a recommended restaurant in theory okay. um however for spas we will not evaluate a spa it won't be approved like we talked about at the very beginning it won't be approved to be evaluated if the hotel is not so the hotel does already have to either either have achieved a star rating or be in the approval process for the spa to be eligible to um, and, and the reason for that is that, you know, you talked about our website at the beginning. It, it's, it's an experience in and of itself within the destination where that guest might be going. Um, so for us to have a spa hovering around with no hotel attached to it <laughs> on the, as a website experience for a consumer is, is a little more challenging. Got it. That, that makes total sense. And I hope that, and that totally cleared up the answer to that question. It was a great question, yeah. but as you said, you know, if there's no, you know, hotel or larger property, you know, attached to that spa, it likely, you know, won't qualify. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Time for the spa leader masterclass fast five. Amanda, what time do you start your day? 5 30. <laughs> 5 oh my goodness okay am <laughs> am just to be clear <laughs> absolutely okay morning people hands down the best people i start my day at 4 a.m um what is your favorite spa treatment massage facial body nails massage got it coffee or tea coffee how, how many cups <laughs> At least two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you could visit one place in the world tomorrow, where would you go? Well, England to see my family. I haven't been oh. in two years because of the virus. So yeah. yeah, it would be nice to get back sometime soon. Got it. I, and I hope you do get to go sooner rather than yeah. later because everyone needs to see their family. And sure. finally, what is something that you wish you knew when you were 20? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I think... If I was to go back in time and give myself advice or give anyone advice in their 20s is to you know dictate your own pace. Don't let society tell you when your milestones should occur in your life, whether it's your career or your personal life, but just sit back, relax. If you've got like the conviction in yourself as to what you want to do with your life, then those things will happen uh, at your own success rate. That is hands down the uh, most amazing <laughs> answer. Everybody, you can accomplish things at your own pace. You should not be trying to keep up with the Joneses. That was an amazing <laughs> answer. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Amanda Frazier, Executive Vice President of Standards and Ratings for Forbes Travel Guide. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Amanda. My pleasure, Sal. Nice to talk to you. Take care. Very nice to talk to you. And thank you at home or at work for tuning in and being a part of the Spa Leaders Masterclass Series. I'm Sal Capizzi. See you next time. <laughs>